motivate this church. Amen. Uh, if, uh, if it is the will of God, I will come back to that another time. Uh, but this morning, I want to take you to uh, the book of Habakkuk, which is uh, in the Old Testament, end of Old Testament, uh, all the way towards the end of Old Testament. It's a tiny little prophetic book. And uh, we will be looking at chapter 2 and uh, verses 2 and 3. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. I want to talk to you about uh, living on the base of a vision that God has given you. And that's what we're going to meditate on today. Amen. The book of Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. We all have one life, and uh, we can choose to live whichever way we want to live. That life will be pretty soon over. And at the end of that life, when you look back, you know some people will have satisfaction. Some people will have regrets. Because if you don't handle your life wisely on a daily basis, as you progress in your years and you are, as you're approaching your senior years, you will have nothing but regrets. I'm pretty sure that every one of us have some regrets in our life, things we should not have done, we, should, we have done. That, I'm not talking about that. But in general, you need a purpose for living, a purpose for life, a reason for life. People who don't have a reason for life die faster. Have you noticed that? Now, even the medical technology has uh, acknowledged, learned this and acknowledged this. And when they put patients in the, in, the, in the hospital, they not only try to just give them the tablets or the injection or the surgery that they need, but they also try to encourage them. They train the medical professionals to speak to them and encourage them, ask them questions about their family, about their loved ones, you know, about the children by home or a husband by home or wife by home. Why? Because they're trying to rekindle the hope within them. Sometimes you are on the brink of death because of a sickness, but the hope, if there's a, re there's a hope there, then you will wait. You know, I do not know how many of you have seen that in this country, but back home I know where I grew up, I know that the grandparents sometimes just lay on the sick bed for days or weeks or even months, because in those days people couldn't afford to try uh, take a plane all the time. So sometimes they were thousands of miles away and they had to come uh, um, even after you send them a telegram. There was no mobile phone. You send them a telegram that your father is dying. You know, if you want to see him, come back soon. Come, come home soon. And uh, and after they receive the telegram, they get the vacation ready or, or the holidays ready, and they take a train and sometimes take many days to get home. But you know, the father always would wait until the child reaches home. And you, then you see the child come home, and the child goes near dad and say, Dad, Dad, I'm here, I'm here. And he may, if he can, he may open his eyes. Sometimes he will just try to shake his head, acknowledge the presence of his child, and in a few minutes he will be gone. Because that hope kept him alive for all that time. Amen? So it's very important to have hope in our life. Amen? So I want to ask you a question this morning. What is the purpose of your life? When you look forward to, what do you see? Amen? And that's the topic that we're going to talk about. And Friday night, I think Friday night or Saturday night, my wife was, no, Friday morning, uh, my wife was asking the same question when she was sharing from the Word of God because she was asking God, Lord, I, I, you know, I got married when I was young. Now I have become a grandma. Uh, my children are all settled and, and I have seen my grandchildren. Is there anything left for me to live for? What am I looking forward to now? Well, I don't know. I don't know what, what happened to me. I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. Amen. So, see, we, we, we are confronted. We are confronted, right, with this issue. So, so we, vision is very important. Now, how do, you, how do you live based on a vision? 
But before I tell you that, I want to uh, challenge you to develop a vision, develop a reason, develop a purpose for your life. If you never sat down and think about it, you know, you have to think about that. And, and you have to dedicate your life. This is what I'm going to live for, for the rest of my life. And then you will have a, then the rest of the messages, message will become meaningful to you. But if you don't take that first step, this will be just another message. Amen. That's another sermon that I preach. But I don't like to preach sermons for the sake of preaching sermons. I want my message to make a difference in your life. Amen. So it doesn't matter where you are today, how pathetic or hopeless it look in you know the situations look in your life today. You can still make a plan. You don't have to accept what you have in your life today. You don't have to accept the situation. You don't have to accept the status quo. You can make up your mind to change your life, to change your lifestyle, and and go in a different direction and 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 accomplish something with your life. Amen. I hope you do that. You listen to me. Amen. So if you look at uh, this passage that we read this morning, the beginning of verse 2, it says, The Lord answered me. As soon as you hear that, it, that, that tells you that, uh, that uh, he, was, uh, he had asked a question to God. And you know what is that question? The question is there in the chapter 1 and verse 2. You know what is the question that he asked? How long? Lord, how long? <laughs> Amen. The same question that we ask. But he was referring to the restoration of Israel. That's the only difference. How many times we have asked that question? Lord, how long? How long we have to wait before we see your answer? How long before I wait before I have to see my miracle? How long I have to wait you know, before I see your hand moving in my life? And that's where Habakkuk was. And he, because he was a prophet to the nation, he was speaking to the whole nation, not or himself only, but for the whole nation. And then God and he continued to ask questions. There are two major dialogues going on in chapter 1. I'm not going to stay there. We don't have time for that. But when he come to chapter 2, God started giving him answer. And said, uh, Habakkuk, this is, the, this is the direction I'm going to give you. I want you to write down your vision. Write down what I'm telling you. And because at the end of chapter 1, God had given them a promise. And uh, then he challenged him and said, uh, Write this down. That's how we are going to begin. I'm going to show you seven steps of vision-based living this morning. The first thing that you have to do is write down your vision. There's something about writing down things. Do you agree with me? Now, we are walking away from uh, the days of writing down things, right? Because you don't have to write down. If you have an Android phone, you don't even have to type a text. You just speak and the text will show up. Are you with me? So people are writing less and less and less. In the early days, I used to write a lot, but now even I'm getting lazy. I, I notice that. I'm getting lazy. You know, we don't write. We don't like to write. We like to speak and, and just send a voice memo or something. Amen. But there's something beautiful about writing it down because there is a concrete something on a piece of paper. When years ago when I was working in the corporate world, I realized something. If I write down the previous night, everything I had to do, you know, some days you're, you're, you're so overwhelmed, you don't have enough time to do everything that you want to do. I noticed that the previous night I sat down and took a piece of paper and wrote down everything I had to do the next day. By noontime, everything was done. By noontime, everything was done. I said, man, what a difference writing things down makes. Because you don't waste time. You stay focused. You go from point A to point B to point C, and you can get it done. Amen? So he, God came down to Habakkuk and said, uh, Habakkuk, you have to write this down. Amen? And uh, I, I, I will develop uh, that a little more. So remember what I told you earlier? You need to look into yourself and write down what is the purpose of my life. You know, as a pastor of this church, I have to write down what is the purpose of this, this church. I'm coming to that in a second. So in, in the early days of Christianity, in the beginning days of Christianity, when the Romans ruled the world, there was a Latin phrase. It is in your notes. It's noti soton. That's a Latin phrase. That simply meant know yourself. Know thyself. 
That was a Latin phrase that was very common in there because most of the education in those days was not science and technology. Most of the education in those days were philosophy. So you went to a philosopher as a teacher, and the philosopher was, uh, was teaching you. So he taught you at his, at his level, and the first thing that he would instill in you is to get a grip on yourself. Are you with me? Amen. Can you turn to the person sitting next to you and say, you need to get a grip on yourself. We are so busy fixing everyone else. We are so busy fixing everyone else. Amen. We go around trying to fix everyone in the world, but we don't look at ourselves. Amen. So this Latin phrase should stay with you. Know thee so torn. That means know thyself. Do you know yourself? Do you know yourself? But that question should not be addressed to your neighbor. That question should be addressed to you. Okay? So put a finger at your chest and repeat after me. Do you know yourself? Try to answer that question later, okay? Do you know yourself? Do you know who you are? How well you know yourself? It's very important because only then you can fulfill the purpose of your life. Because God did not waste his time to create you. You are not an afterthought. You are a masterpiece. Amen. There's only one like, there's only one person among more than six billion people on the face of the earth. There's only one person like you. And that's you. There's no carbon copies of you. Amen. You are not cloned. Amen. There's not only one like you. So you are a masterpiece. And God created you for a purpose. And you need to understand that purpose in order to accomplish that purpose. So put your finger to your chest and ask that question again. Do you know yourself? It's very important. Amen. The Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, has said that uh, mastering others shows your strength, but mastering yourself is the true power. Amen. Many of us are so good in taking care of others, but so poor in taking care of ourselves. Am I telling the truth? We are so good in taking care of other people, but so poor in taking care of ourselves. Now, it is about time you pay some attention to number one. Amen? It is about time you pay some attention to you because days are passing by. Years are passing by. We are already in year 2017. Amen? We, I mentioned two families that they lost their loved ones this week. How, how, how much days we have left? How do we know? We don't know. If today is the last day of our life on the face of the earth when people get up to say something nice about us and then and people evaluate your life, what will they conclude? He ate a lot of hamburgers. He could sit and end here pizza in one sitting. What will people think about us? We must, there must be something to say about us. Our life must abound to something. Our days on the face of the earth must amount to something. So you need to look into yourself. Amen? And make a clear assessment and make changes where it is needed. Amen. It's not only needed for an for individual, it's also needed for a, an organization like our church. Now, that's where this message came to me. Because when I was thinking about get this church doing what it's supposed to do. Amen. So when we have an organization, we usually develop a vision statement and a mission statement. A vision is always pointing towards the future. Amen. I, I believe it's in there, in, in your notes, right? And they will put that on the PowerPoint also. So a vision statement is what this church wants to become eventually. That is our vision. Vision is always aimed towards the future. future. And the mission statement is the purpose. The, what do we exist for? How do we do that? What do we do on a day-by-day -day basis so that we will eventually fulfill our vision? And that's what the difference between a vision statement and a mission statement. If you look at your notes, the vision statement or gateway is given there. It's, I, I summarized it into one sentence, okay? And I put it there. To become a local church with a global impact in a fast-changing society by teaching and following the principles laid out in the Bible. 
I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break it down. Okay? We want to be a local church with a global impact. To an extent, we are already doing that. Do you know that? We are not a very big church, but we have an international impact as a local church. Amen? Because of the mission work we do, because of the trips that I take to go and preach in different nations and the conferences I attend and a pastors' conferences where I go and train pastors, etc., we already have an international impact, even though we are not a very big church. But I want that impact to increase, increase. Amen? Now, um, some of you are from the country of Guyana, and uh, uh, I was surprised when I was speaking to someone in Guyana. They said, oh, we know you're a church. You know, I was very surprised to hear that. I said, how do you know our church? We are in New York. And they said, uh, because pastors come to New York and uh, people in New York talk about your church. So I said, okay. I was really encouraged. Then I decided that then we should build up on that. Amen. And I started praying about opportunities to build up on that. And, uh, uh, and starting next week, we're going to start a television program in the nation of Guyana. Amen. We got it for a very, 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 very low price. We got it. So we're going to start a television program there so people will get to know this church and the ministry. This is what they're going to air over there, the ministry here, going to air there. And people will get to know this church more. And later, we want to build up on that more and uh, systematically do something in that nation. Amen. Helping that nation. So we want to become a local church with a global impact. Amen. Some parts of Africa, we help, etc. You know, I want that global impact to increase. But how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we increase our impact? Not by giving a lot of money. No, that's one way to do it. But that's not the real impact. The real impact of a church, real impact of a ministry is changed lives. Amen? Because we are here to extend the kingdom of Jesus. Amen? The, the, the greatest mission that we have is the Great Commission. To go here into all the nation and preach the gospel. And that is, how, that is our real mission. So how do we increase our global impact? By teaching by first of all, by teaching. Secondly, we are ourselves following the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you look closely in that statement, that even though it's only one state, one sentence, you can see that we are also acknowledging that the society is changing. But we are saying that we are not going to change with the society. Society can change. We cannot stop the change in the society. But in a changing society, we will stay there, you know, stay on the Word of God and continue to teach the Word of God, continue to follow the Word of God. Amen? And that's how this church is going to grow and church is going to become a local church with a global impact. Amen? Hallelujah. If you believe that, if you accept that, give the Lord a clap offering in this place. Amen. Second thing, the mission statement. How do we... Get there. What are the nitty-gritty part of that? See, it's a, it's, a, it's a small paragraph given there in your notes. It says, our mission is to introduce a loving God to everyone. Amen. We come in contact with. Because that's how we're going to introduce them to Jesus, right? Through loving them. We have to tell them that there is a loving God out there. Amen. Hallelujah. So how do we do that? We, it is centered around three words. Three words. When, a few years ago, when I was sitting in the presence of God, and uh, asking God for a mission statement for our church. This is what God put in my spirit. Amen. So everything that we do here in this church is centered around three key words. One is to experience. Because before you experience the love of God, you don't change. That's the beginning. That's where your change you know, starts. Amen. So experience. And then the second word is grow and the third word is share. Let me show you the three aspects of that. We want you to experience the love of God on Sunday morning. Amen. When you come to worship service, you want, I, we want you to experience a loving God. We want you to experience the presence of God in our worship. That's why I'm not happy with the routine service. I am not happy with the program. Amen. Because I want to make sure people who attend this service experience something. Experience the presence of God. Amen. 
And the presence of God should be tangible here. And how do we make that tangible? The worship team has to come prepared for that. The pastor has to come prepared for that. The ministers in the church has to come prepared for that. Amen. We all need to sit in the presence of God and pray, Lord, we know somebody will be coming there on that Sunday morning and somebody who need to know you, somebody who need to be introduced to Jesus Christ, help us to do that, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. So the faith that we proclaim is not an intellectual faith. The faith that we proclaim is an experiential faith. Are you with me? Buddhism, for example, is an intellectual faith. They sit down and meditate and they come up with this and that. And they say, just convert on that. Amen. But we don't say that. We say, no, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. If he has done it once, he can do it again. If he healed people in the pages of the gospel, he can heal people in 2017. If he can deliver people in the first century, he can deliver people in the 21st century. That's what we declare. But the declaration is not enough. People should experience that. Amen. It's important because the greatest testimony of God's power is a miracle. Hallelujah. The greatest testimony of God's power is a miracle. Amen. When you go to Acts chapter 3, somebody was preaching on that this week during our prayer meetings. You know, we see a miracle happening in Acts chapter 3, a lame man getting up and walking. But in chapter 4, a whole bunch of people got together to punish them, to persecute them, persecute the early church. But they had a problem. They looked at what happened and said, there's an undeniable miracle that has happened. How are you going to deny this? You cannot talk this away. You cannot call a media outlet and tell them to put out a bad story. You cannot make a fake news about a miracle. I must change that sentence. You cannot make a fake news about a real miracle. Are you with me? You cannot make a fake news about a real miracle. Once a real miracle happens, everyone can see it, everyone can witness it, everyone can have to acknowledge it, and you can show that Jesus is still alive. Hallelujah! Come on, people, wake up in this place this morning. Praise you, Lord. We shared, uh, we shared with you what happened in our family this week. Tuesday morning, as I was attending the prayer session, the Spirit of God all of a sudden started stirring me up to pray for my youngest daughter. She's a medical doctor um, doing residency. And she took a break from that residency for her wedding and stuff. And now she wants to continue that residency and uh, she's accepted into a program and uh, she's ready to move. And she already started packing to move. She went and uh, took an apartment at that place. Her husband quit her his job. Great job. He was working for Northrop, North, Northrop, you know, the defense contractor. Quit his job. They took an apartment and they already started packing stuff. And Mercy is scheduled to go there for two, three days to help them. And I'm supposed to go there, visit them later. We made all these plans. Then Tuesday, the Spirit of God woke me up and said, pray for your youngest daughter. Intercede for your youngest daughter. And I, sitting right there, I started praying, not knowing what is going on. But I know if the Spirit of God tell me, there's a reason for it. Amen? So we started praying. I prayed, prayed. And went home. Around 5 o'clock, she called home and said, is mom next to you? I need to tell, speak to both of you. And she was working that day. I said, what happened, baby? She said, dad, I have bad news. Because she's moving from one state to another, and they refuse to accept her MD license. So they're bringing up some you know, issues about that. And so I won't be able. She's supposed to start her uh, program on July 1st. And I won't be able to start on July 1st, maybe. If everything gets through, uh, I will be able to start on October 1st. I said, no, baby. No. We are not accepting that. We are not accepting that. After you did all this, all this preparation, after your husband quit the job, after you went and signed the lease for an apartment, you know, the enemy is going to bring something at the very last second, and we're going to accept it? No, no way. No way we're going to accept it. 
Amen. So I encouraged her and I told her, you don't have to worry because I already prayed for you. I already prayed for you. Amen. So I said, listen, this morning, God already asked me to pray for you. Now I know why he was telling me to pray for you. Because just when I was saying, they were shooting an email to her that uh, she won't be able to start on July 1st. But I said, don't worry, we'll continue to pray. And we prayed that night. Wednesday, after prayer, when we went home, her husband called and said, uh, everything is taken care of. Everything came through. I'm telling you, refuse to accept the verdict from hell. Refuse to accept the verdict from Satan. You are a child of God. Amen. In multiple sessions during this week of prayer, I was talking about spiritual authority. Because as a child of God, you have spiritual authority. Amen. You have to learn to stand on that authority. And you have to learn to take that authority. And you have to learn to exercise that authority. Instead of, uh, instead of listening to everything what the enemy is saying. Amen. Who is he? He's the father of lies. He's not going to come into your life to come to and destroy and steal and kill. Nothing. Nothing in your life. Hallelujah. Half of you are sleeping through my message. I don't know how you can do that. When I'm getting so crazy over here, you are sleeping through my message. Maybe when your child gets a breakthrough, you will get excited. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So you have to write it down. Amen. I like I know people who write down every prophecy. You know, this this daughter that we that that I mentioned, our youngest daughter, ever since she was a child, she heard so many uh, you know prophecies over her life. And you know, as soon as I, we gave her a, a phone, every time a prophet starts, he says, wait, 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 and she will turn on her phone. I should record that prophecy because she wanted to know whether it's coming to pass or not. <laughs> write it down. Turn to somebody and say, write it down. Write it down. Amen. Get serious. When you write things down, you're getting serious. It's not a coming through this year and going out through this year. Write it down. Write down the promises upon your life. Write down the prophecies that come into your life. Write down what God has talked to, talk to you through his word. Write down the scriptures that have spoken to you. Write it down. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And second thing that uh, God told Habakkuk was, write it down on a tablet. You know, in those days, they didn't have banners. So they inscribed on a clay tablet or on a stone. And he said, write it down on a tablet. Inscribe it on a tablet and, uh, so, and, and, and put it where people can see. In other words, he was uh, giving Habakkuk permission to publish publicize his vision, what God has told him. Amen? God allows us to declare our vision. Amen? There is absolutely nothing to be ashamed about speaking about your vision. Amen? Hallelujah. I know sometimes we are caught by what Jesus told us. You know, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But that's about personal giving. That's not about vision. That's about your personal giving. Amen? Don't go around and publicize your personal giving like the publicans did in the Jesus day. That's what he was saying. But a vision is different because a vision can never be accomplished by you alone. A vision needs partners. Amen? Can you turn to somebody and say you need partners in your life? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We cannot live by ourselves. We need partners in our lives. Amen? Look. Listen, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 30, God said one will chase a thousand and two will chase 10,000, 10,000. Amen. How can you do that? Because you are a partner. So when you get a partner in your life, it's not addition that happens. It is multiplication that happens. Are you with me? Amen. It's not addition that happens. It's multiplication that happens. Amen. That's why you need partners for whatever is the vision that God has given us. That's the reason behind our 
mission partnership program that ever we came and uh, introduced to you last week. Amen. Because when partners come on and join with us, there's multiplied effect. And the third thing, our time is running, so let me run, rush through this. The third thing that he said was that uh, when you write it down, write it down in big letters so people who are passing by will read it. Make sure people will read it. How can people read something that God has given you if you don't publish it? Are you with me? Amen. So God said, there's nothing wrong. Produce something that others can read. So that's why we have brochures for this church. Sometimes people ask me, why you get a big publicity? No, that's what God told us to do. Amen. Produce something that people can read. And God said, uh, so that the one who read will run, start running. That means write in such a good way that it will impact the person who read it. Amen? Use the good language. Make sure your grammar is correct. Make sure there is no spelling mistake. Make sure you, you rewrite things so until it becomes so impactful that as soon as somebody reads it, it impacts them and leads them to action. Hallelujah. So, what was God trying to tell Habakkuk? A vision must be acted on. A vision must be acted upon. Amen? Until... A vision is acted upon, it remains a dream, not a vision. Amen? So remind somebody, turn to somebody sitting next to you and say, until you act on your vision, it remains a dream. So what are you following? A dream or a vision? Come on, come on. What are you following? A dream or a vision? A dream is a dream that comes natural to you. But until you act upon your vision, your vision also will be simply a dead dream. That's why a lot of people come up with a lot of good ideas, but never accomplish anything. Because they don't act upon it. Amen? Am I telling the truth in this place? Amen. God put a, gave a vision to William Carey. All of us know he was one of the major mission figures. He was uh, from England and gave him a vision to go to China. And when he went to the Baptist, he was a, belonged to a Baptist church, went to the Baptist mission board, and told them, God put a, a, with this vision in my heart, I need partners. Because William Carey was a cobbler, fixing shoes, made very little money in those days. So he didn't have enough money to buy a ticket to go to China. So he said, uh, the God put this vision in my heart, I need partners. You know the mission board turned him down? The mission board said, uh, Young man, because they believed in uh, Calvinism, you know. Uh, I don't have time for all of that. Uh, so, bottom line is this. They said, young man, if God wants to save the Chinaman, you know, this is the word they use. If God wants to save the Chinaman, God will raise up a Chinaman. Why you Englishman want to go over there and try to save the Chinaman? You know why? Because they didn't understand his vision. So William Carey worked very hard, and a few people helped him individually, and he went to China and started the China Inland Mission and changed the history of missions and became the forefather of all these modern-day mission movements. Because you have to act. People may stand up against you when you follow your vision, but you cannot give up on your mission. I will, I will, I will touch on that again. Amen? So you have to act. Gandhi had a vision when he was in South Africa. And he, he felt in his heart that I need to go back to India and take care of the, you know, bring, bring uh, freedom to India from British. And when he went to India, he came, started, term, you know, journeying with his three-piece suit in the train. And he realized, looked around, and he realized that he's the only person wearing a three-piece suit. And he said, these people are not going to buy my vision if I am dressed up like a pins and they are dressed up like paupers. You know, they only had one dhoti wrapped around them. So he gave up, that's where he gave up the suit. And he started wearing that dhoti. You know, that, that's the way you have seen him in, all him in all his pictures. But that's not the way he dressed up as a young man. He used to always go around with a three-piece suit. But he realized that in order to fulfill my mission, I need, my vision, I need to, my mission is to identify with these people whom I have come to help. And he changed. Amen? Now, Acting upon a vision is not easy, though. You have to pay a price. 
Many times you have to pay a price. Amen. Everyone who had a vision had to pay a price. Are you with me? Amen. You know the story of Moses. We talked about Moses recently. Moses had to leave the palace. He could have been a prince of Egypt. But he, well, he, he lived his life. He did not live his life, entire life as a prince of Egypt. Until he was a young man, he was a prince of Egypt. But he had to give that up and identify with the slave people called Israelites to become their deliverer. It cost him. It cost him. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for uh, an emperor. And cupbearer is not a, not a little job. Cupbearer was one of the highest position in the empire. Because if before the, the emperor actually drank the wine, this man had to drink the wine first and taste the wine first and make sure it's not poison before it is given to emperor. So he was one of the most trusted people of the emperor. But uh, when God put a vision in his heart that the Jerusalem lay waste and, uh, and the, all, the, all, the, all the walls are broken down and everything in that city is burned down and I need to go and take the initiative to rebuild the city. You know, he had to give up his job in the, em in the emperor's palace. It cost him. Peter was not a wealthy man, but he still had a board and a net. A little businessman with a board and a net. And as soon as Jesus entered into his board and changed his attitude and changed his outlook and Jesus challenged him to leave your net and your board and follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He left that. One day he asked Jesus, Jesus, the only thing I had in this world was that board and my net. I left that and followed you. What will I get? Because he knew it cost him something. Jesus had equality with God. He was the object of worship in heaven. And he had to leave that equality with God to come down and become a human being to become our Savior and fulfill the vision that was in his life. Everyone who wanted to follow a vision had to pay a price. I hope you don't mind me saying this. Last week, Prince was helping me. You know, Prince is one of our members who helping me with all, all the IT stuff etc. and also getting the, the DVDs ready for our TV programs here and abroad etc. Um, so when she was in the media room, she said, okay, I am going to clean up this place one day. And she opened up and started cleaning up and she said, Pastor, there are hundreds and hundreds of DVDs of your message in this room. The shelves are full of messages because we are here since 2008. And every Sunday, my message has been recorded. And most of those messages are in the room. On, on, and most of them on DVDs, uh, very early ones on tapes. I don't know even those tapes will work now. So, you know, all of a sudden, a crazy thought came to my mind. And I told her something. And I said it and then started thinking about it. I told her, Princey, Take good care of it. That's the estate I'm going to leave behind. It just came out of my mouth. And then I started thinking. In my young age, God challenged me to leave the job. You know, good job I had. And to serve him full time. The early years of my full time ministry was so struggling. Financially struggled so much. But I stayed faithful. But if I remained in my secular field, I was an engineer. If I remained in my secular field, I would be commanding a six-digit salary for years now. Unless, just like everyone else, I would have left multiple homes behind and a, a portfolio of stocks behind, etc. But because I obeyed God, probably when I die, if I die today, the biggest thing I'm going to leave behind is my messages. I'm not upset about that. I'm not ashamed of that. I am, I'm glad I had the courage to follow God, trust God and follow Him. God has been good to us. Amen. All three of our children are doing good. You know, I mean, all of them, my, my children and my son-in-laws and daughter-in-law, have at least a graduate level education. You know, I mean, they're all well-educated, doing well. We somehow God took care of all of this in this journey. But I, don't, I will not have multiple homes to leave behind. I will not have a stock portfolio, a Wall Street portfolio to leave behind. But I will have more than 1,000 DVDs. 
to leave behind. Amen? Make good use of it after I leave, okay? Make good use of it. Because that's where I poured out my heart and my sweat and my blood and my inspiration into that. Because every Sunday I come prepared. I don't come just to waste your time. Amen? So, so what I'm trying to say is when you want to follow a vision, it will cost you. You must better be ready to pay the price. If you're not ready to pay the price, you cannot see your vision fulfilled. That's why most of us don't see our vision fulfilled. Amen? Point number four, quickly. Point number four. Then God said, even though you are doing this, it's not going to happen today. The vision is for an appointed time. It's for an appointed time. It's going to come. It's going to happen in the future. But it will happen. Amen? There's a set date for your vision. We cannot rush the vision. Don't rush the vision. Turn to somebody and say, don't rush the vision. Because shortcuts will only mess up things. Amen. God gave a vision to Abraham and Sarah and said, you step out and start following me. And I'm going to bless you with a child. And through that child, the nation is going to come into existence. All the people on the face of the earth is going to be blessed. And they waited and waited and waited and didn't see the vision fulfilled. And you know the story. Then the Hagar entered into the picture. They decided to help God by coming with a shortcut. And you know, since then, human history has been Messed up because of that until now. Don't go for shortcuts. Don't rush the vision. Wait upon the Lord. Because next to your vision, there's a date. And when that date comes, that vision will be fulfilled. I can guarantee you it will be fulfilled. Amen. There's a vision next to your promise. When that date comes, by the time that date comes, that promise will be fulfilled. Because God is always moving in the behind the scenes. God is always doing things on your, on your behalf. Point number five. God said, wait for it. That means stay motivated. Stay motivated. That is the biggest problem we all have, right? Biggest problem. Staying motivated while we wait for the vision to be fulfilled or the dreams to come through. But you can do something. Don't waste your time. You know, I heard, I, I think it was my wife who was saying this, this week during the prayers again and again, waiting time is not a wasted time. <laughs> Amen. Waiting time is not a wasted time. Amen. So do make use of this time. Do something. You know, David had a vision to build the Jerusalem temple. And God told him, you are not going to build it. Because you have shed so much blood with your hands. So I'm going to allow your son to build the temple. So David didn't sit back and said, okay, for the rest of my life, I'm just going to party. And let my son come and do whatever he needed to do. No. Every day he was, you know, accumulating resources for that temple. So much so that when Solomon appeared on the scene, he had nothing to do. All he had to do was just use the resources his father had accumulated. Amen. Paul, when he was called at the city gates of Damascus, God gave him three visions. God said, you're going to be a, a witness unto my people, which is the Jewish people. And then he said, you're going to be a witness unto the Gentiles. And then he said, uh, you're also going to be witness before kings and and princes. But you want to know something? The first time Paul got up and shared his testimony in Jerusalem, people said, we know who you are. We don't trust you. We know what you did in the past. You know, we don't, we don't accept you. And they kicked him out from there. And he had to go back to his hometown of Tarsus and stay there for years until Barnabas came looking for him. But you know, he was not wasting his time. He started teaching Bible. He became a Bible teacher. And even when Barnabas found him and brought him to the city of Antioch, he didn't immediately get to preach to the kings and princes. He was a Bible teacher in a local church. Until God said, now the time has come to set apart Paul and Barnabas for the mission I have called them for. That's where he turned to the next level, rose up to the level of apostle and started moving. And we know only towards the end of his life, he actually started sharing the gospel with the kings and the princes. So, sometimes you have to stay motivated. Amen? And it's not easy. I know, I acknowledge it's not easy. But you have to stay motivated. Use the time that God is giving you today. Amen? And your vision will come through. Point number six. Do not discard your vision because it's taking too long. Remember, the Bible said, uh, though it tarries, wait for it. Amen? 
At the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Amen. The English Standard Version Bible says, even if it seems slow. New Life Translation said, even if it uh, seems slow in coming. You know, you can sometimes give up on your vision. Remember, Abraham and Sarah almost did. One day, finally, when God came and said, next year, by this time, you're going to have your child. They turned around and said, God, you don't need to do that anymore. Just allow Ishmael to live. Because they gave up. They waited too long. And they got tired of waiting. Don't do that. Amen. Do not discard your vision. Amen. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Even if it's tarrying, even if it's taking too long. I know some of you expected a breakthrough in 2016. And it didn't happen. I know that. Personally, I know that. But that doesn't mean that in 2017 you give up on that vision, give up on that dream, to give up on that hope. Amen. No, no. You hold on. You hold on. Because the one who gave you the word is faithful. He will come through for it. Hallelujah. Finally, the seventh point in that verse, those two verses is that it will certainly come. It will certainly come. Sometimes you have to wait, but it will happen. Amen. Joseph got a vision as a young child. God spoke to him through visions, right? Again and again. But his experiences, are, the following experience had nothing to do with the vision. He had to wait and wait and wait and wait. But Joseph became the prime minister in Egypt. Amen. Just like he saw in his dream, his brothers came and bowed down before him. Amen. Just everything God showed him came to pass. Amen. David killed Goliath when he was a teenage boy, but then he had to wait for years and years and years and years before he became the king. But he did become the king. Not only that he did become the king, he became the greatest king in the history of Israel. Amen. Paul was told, as I told you earlier, that he will stand before the kings one day, but he had to wait for many years before it actually happened. I know many of you are waiting. I spoke this message to encourage you. And I spoke this message to motivate this church. We must stick to our vision. You must stick to your vision. You must stick to your vision. Don't allow circumstances to change you. Amen. Don't allow opposition to change you. Don't allow negative experience to change you. Stay focused and tarry. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Stand up with me all over this place.